maybe. Hey, there it is. I see nope. the little button. No? No, it should be red. No, we're good. You're right. Hi. Oh. <laughs> Welcome to, uh, welcome to Write More Light. I am uh, Sarah Elgatian with the Midwest Writing Center. We're sitting down today with Madeline Belk, a youth services librarian in Tinley Park. Oh, Winneka Northfield. Winneka Northfield. I was just looking at your Facebook. I apologize. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm so excited about it. Maddie is one of my favorite humans. Um, and uh, so, are so are libraries. Libraries are my favorite humans. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself or I can break out the questions right away? Um, well, I've been a youth services librarian for um, about six years. Uh, I started at Grand Prairie and then I did work at Tinley Park for a while. Um, and now I work at the Winneka Library. There's, it's the Winneka Northfield Library. There's um, two locations. Uh, so we was down south of Chicago for a while and then moved up north of Chicago. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> uh, so what are the, what's the, the daily life of a children's librarian? Uh, well, for me, um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things. What was that? Pre-COVID. Oh, pre-COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair. <laughs> um, I mean, so I do story time. Well, I did story time twice a week before COVID. I did the Tuesday morning and Wednesday morning um, at Winneka. Uh, before that, I did story time at Tinley on Thursday evenings, which was the only um, like evening story time. Uh, and then at Grand Prairie, I just, we, we didn't have a lot of story times. We just had one and everybody kind of rotated in and out of doing it. Um, so yeah, bef before COVID, I did the Tuesday morning and Wednesday morning story times. Um, and now I just do Wednesday morning. Um, so we kind of pared down what we offer because we do it on Zoom. In, in the, like the new version is on Zoom. Um, it's, I, what I do is pretty much the same, but like the, the way that the patrons interact with story time is, is very different from before and after. Um, before we'd get a lot of parents and like nannies who would come in and like they would sit in the back and talk to each other and I would like entertain the kids in the front. And now it's really more of like parents looking to do something with their kids. And so the Zoom response is a lot more of like, we're gonna take 30 minutes today and we're gonna do this together and we're gonna sing songs and listen to stories and like, really engage, which has been really, really great. Um, Cause like COVID has been really tough and everything, but like the people who come are really, like really excited to be there. <laughs> um, That's so, so yeah, nice. story times. Yeah, story time's a big part of it. Um, I do a lot of programs at, when I worked at Tinley, I bought books for like, I think what they call it now is the middle grade fiction. We called it juvenile. Um, I like so it feels less. Yeah. <laughs> well, people didn't like the term juvenile. Like we, we changed it to J, J fiction in at, we have J fiction, junior high fiction and teen fiction. Um, and then the picture books at Winneka. Um, and people don't like juvenile because the, the only other time they hear that is juvenile delinquent. Right. So or, it's like this weird association that people, <laughs> parents are like, so it's more of like that people ask like where are the chapter books or like where is your elementary school books yeah, or like yeah middle grade so it's it's just it's a lot easier it's a lot more identifiable I think I um I never put together that that was uh that middle grade was what I would have called juvenile or like found in the mm. library under juvenile um because I didn't, I mean, I interacted with the term as an adult um, who works with kids and reads kids lit. Um, I never would have connected that with the J section in the in the library. That's really weird that I never thought of that. Yeah, I don't know. It's it, the, like what terms we use for what types of books changes library to library. Um, 
And then once you get the schools involved, it gets really complicated. Um, Cause a lot of schools will put um, like number identifiers on their books. So they'll use um, the Luxile numbers or accelerated reader, um, or they'll make their own like homebrew version. Like the school librarian is like, great, I'm doing the alphabet and A books are, you know, one word on a page, Mo Willems all the way to Z, which is war and peace, you know? And it, so kids will come in and they're like, I'm a J, where are the J levels? And I'm like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> so like, that's, that's Man, been that's an interesting, so yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's sometimes the teachers will like send us their lists, but then we get like one specific teacher's list out of the whole school you know, cause like that teacher comes in and gets books from us and she's like, oh, I made a list. Here's my, my levels or something using whatever qualifications they've set. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting way of like, I have a coworker who had a great, like the, like some kid was in with their mom and the kid was like, oh, I want to read this. And the mom was like, oh, this is, I remember this one. This one's an easier like letter and you can read a harder letter. And so my coworker was like, oh, well they can read all the way to that hard level, but then the easier ones too. And right. so the kid was able to take the book. And I was just like, oh man, cause it's, it's easy to get kind of funneled into these, you know, oh, I have to find, you know, something with a 600, Luxile number, or like I can only read, you know, and so a lot of a lot of stuff with the public library is kind of trying to like break free of that a little. <laughs> Where it's like you can actually just read what you what you want. If you it want. looks good, you could try it. <laughs> I I'm really glad to hear that. Um, as I'm not surprised, right? You're a you're a librarian. You do this, of course. You're going to encourage people to read whatever they want. That's how you get people reading. Um, but it's yes. really nice to see that it is real and happens and it's not in my head hoping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and it's it's fun because as the children's librarian, I almost feel like a translator between kids and their parents sometimes. Like I get a lot of parents who are very like anti-graphic novel. They're like, it's not a real book, blah, blah, blah. Like you, you need a real book. And a lot of times I'll tell them like, well, I've read this one and this is what I gained from it. Or like, I really liked the themes or I liked this. Um, and that kind of wears down some of those walls, I think, where they have like this really rigid idea in their head. Like, well, I, when I was a kid, we didn't even have these. So you're going to read what I liked. And right. that doesn't always, sometimes, it, I mean, sometimes the kids are into that, but. I've definitely <laughs> working at a bookstore I've definitely told parents or compared it compared graphic novels like to comfort the parents as like a gateway drug to mm. reading um, yeah I know yeah. they've come out with like a ton of books that we read as kids or like people even older than us read as kids now have graphic novel versions and oh I think you're talking about the babysitter's club babysitter's club and um <laughs> oh my god I can't think of the title wrinkle in time I was going to say walk two moons. Oh, and I was like, oh walk yes. Graphic yeah. novels, but I don't think one exists. Um, I, uh, I really liked, and I don't know if there's more of these now, but um, the manga versions of classic literature. Yeah. And you there's know, like there's Emma and <laughs> Pride of Prejudice. And <laughs> there's so many, uh, so many kids, I think, or adults, people we grew up with, people older than us who couldn't get into reading for, you know a lot of a lot of reasons there are a lot of reasons that that reading is hard um but like maybe making it a comic does the trick and the idea of of making of there being gatekeepers to literature is just insane yeah yeah no i i like the graphic novels i like the um the blended uh, graphic novel and like regular novel things that are becoming like really, really popular right now too. Um, you've probably heard of Diary of a Wimpy Kid because mm -hmm. I, I can't go a day without someone asking for it. <laughs> but that's that's a really good example of like, it's got a lot of illustrations. It kind of feels comic-y in that like, you know, oh, there's like, 
plot happening in these pictures but then you know, there's like chunks of text you know and so it's kind of for the really reluctant parents I try to get like those because it's sort mm -hmm. of a coming together <laughs> for them but or I know you know I when just, we were when we were kids there was like um like the diary style books um mm -hmm. like Amelia's notebook mm -hmm. uh, which I don't know I I'm with you I guess is all I'm trying to say I'm just trying to think of other things <laughs> well there's like I mean the dork diaries there's like what like 15 of those or something now like or my life the my life series yeah oh yeah oh yeah it's great because like you know they're fun and it I kind of thought that the diary of a wimpy kid would be like a like a pop thing you know like it would it'd be really popular for a couple years yes. and then kind of like dissipate and everything and I if anything it's just sort of gained steam which is interesting it's probably been what, like 15 years 10 years yeah easily it was early 2000s that it the first one came out of thing yeah yeah it's had the movie yeah I actually saw um so the there's another one that's like the same like vein of book um Big Nate which is like <laughs> a really big one so that author um I saw at I think it was an Anderson's book breakfast thing that they do for like teachers and librarians um and it was a uh, he gave a whole talk about how like he has this new series coming out called Max and the Midnights. And the, the first one is out now, but at the time it was like a, a new book that he was pitching. Um, and there's like a twist about halfway through where you find out that Max, our main character who wants to be a knight, not a troubadour and like finds these other kids who want to break out of their roles they've been assigned and like they have there's this problem in the kingdom and it's like sort of medievally in that like Ren Faire way um and you find out Max is a girl and it's it's sort of played as like a like a twist but it's 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 interesting because like one of the adult characters refers to Max as a boy and Max pulls off her hat and has a ponytail and it's like I'm a girl also I'm gonna, still gonna be a knight and everyone's just like oh so anyway and like yes. they move on um, which is great yes. and I, I it was great because the author was saying that like he wrote Big Nate for him as a kid you know which is what a lot of writers like I wrote the book that I, I needed as a kid and yeah. then somebody had said to him like boy the, the big like children's lit authors that everybody talks about like the Big Nate the Diary of a Wimpy Kid you know all of these books are very boy centered and he was like oh yeah I, yeah I guess I should branch out and so he just did <laughs> and it was great and 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 like I gave it I, I recommended this one to uh a patron it was at Tinley Park actually um because she was looking for something new for her son who is in I'm gonna say like fifth or sixth grade and uh she I, I like gave it to her and I said yeah there's this twist and Max is a girl and yada 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 and like she was like, well, I'll give it to him. And because he was very much one of those, like, if it's not a boy main character, I don't care, which really limits what you, yeah. you can give someone. And so she gave this to her son, like knowing that this thing was coming and like he read it and loved it. And he was, he like branched out from there and was like, well, maybe, maybe I'll try this. Maybe I'll try that and stuff. And so it was, it worked. And it was really fun seeing that like in action, you know? <laughs> Oh, that's so great. Yeah. Also, the thing we, you were talking about with authors branching out, something that I've, I'm sure I've talked about it on, on Write More Light before, but I talk about it to anyone who will listen, um, <laughs> is um, Rick Riordan is like a personal hero of mine. And um, I, I don't know a ton about him as a human. So like, I don't really want to know if there's any controversy. Um, but you know, as Not that I've heard, I don't know. I know um, <laughs> he seems perfect uh, but like as soon as people started like addressing that with him you know he did he did a series and I just leaned over to grab my one of my copies um where you know he puts his name on other people's work so there's these other writers now who are writing like half half blood stories but from their own culture and he does I brought this to to show yeah uh, the Rick Rodin presents to get them credit and that's such a like that's a 
such a simple thing to do where there's people like, you know, James Frey who are just slapping their name on stuff and not giving anyone credit for anything. Um, and, you know, when he, he, there was a tweet I saw once, a friend sent it to me. Um, shout out to Jackie, the uh, um, former children's section lead at uh, the Coralville Barnes & Noble, um, where he was like, ah, yes, the obligatory text of why is there a trans person here well i don't know they exist and it's just like that's all we need that's all we need from our writers um and and yet it's so important oh yeah and and, and the best i okay so i love the rick Warren presents stuff mm -hmm. because it is so unbelievably easy to pitch those books to parents <laughs> and to kids too because it everybody's heard of percy jackson all these kids read it. It is still super, super sought after. Like we have two or three copies of each book in the original Percy Jackson series. And they're always checked out, you know, like kids come in and put the second one, the third one, the fourth one on hold all the time. And so I, and, and the mythology thing is still ongoing. And like, you know, even like the really little kids get like the goddess girls and, you know, like all of those things. So it's, everyone's still sort of thinking about it, which is nice. And so being like, oh, like, you oh. like this, yeah. he he actually has um, these recommended authors. And like, I had a woman and she had, she had like a big mask on and a hat. And so it was sort of weird trying to like talk to her, but this was like a couple of weeks ago at Winneka. And she was like, well, my son just finished Percy Jackson and we wanted the, the other series that he did, the the like Asgard or something like that, the Norse mythology. And we didn't have the first one on Your shelf. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. Um, but we didn't have it on shelf. And I was like, and she wanted to leave with something. And so I was like, well, he does this Rick Warden presents stuff. And I was like, so this one is, you know, Sal and Gabby break the universe is, you know, Latinx kids and stuff. And it's science fiction. Um, and I, I pitched Arushar and the, whatever the first one is, it's not the, the of sands of, the end of time. I thought it was the sands of time. Yeah, no, the end of time. And, uh, she got like super, super jazzed about it. And she's like, oh, well, we're Indian. <laughs> and I was like, oh, <laughs> so she took it. She took the first book and she was like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to read this and then I'll let him read it. And they came back for the second one like a couple weeks later, like really recently. And I was just like, yay. <laughs> but it's fun because uh, it's like, you don't really think about it as like, you know, it's just, you're pitching books. Like these are all fantastic. You're going to love this. And then it's like, wait, I know this mythology. This is mine, you know? And that's what's so beautiful. And like, it just gets me so excited. <laughs> I, um, I did want to, I, I told you the Magnus Chase books, the Asgard ones, are really good. My problem with um, his other series uh, were that Percy wasn't the narrator, and Percy's so funny and, like, sarcastic and, I don't know, a little rude. And so when I read, like, the Roman one, I was kind of bummed out. Um, but Magnus Chase, the narrator of the Asgard books, is, like, a funnier Percy. And my, <laughs> my mom, my mom recommended it to me because there was a trans character who is not even in the first book. And I was really confused about it, but I start reading it and I'm like, mom, the main character is homeless. You could have pitched it that way. I worked in, in shelters for a long time. Like mm -hmm. this is so important, you know, children are homeless and, and he's, he's talking about real stuff. Um, Riordan is. Mm -hmm. Oh um, Yeah. Well, they, there was a book. I can't remember the name of it. I can picture the cover. It's like a blonde girl in sunglasses sitting on top of a school bus. But it's, I want to say it's something like Coyote Summer. I can't remember the name of it. I might be, I might be confusing some too. But there was a book that was on either the Blue Stem or the Coddle like last year or the year before that's about a girl and her mom who live in like an old school bus. And it's, it's like, they know a bunch of other homeless people and like, she's still going to school, but like, doesn't have a home address. And like, it's all of this, like, 
you know, really heavy topic stuff. And it's a middle grade novel. And I, I read kids a book love it. Description um, by, oh, yep, you are totally right. I just found it. I searched it. The Remarkable Journey of Coyote Sunrise. Um, I'm totally yes. going to read it. But I, um, oh my God, what's his name? Matt. Matthew Quick wrote a book that fits that description too, except it's YA, not not middle grade. Um, it's sort of like a rock star. They just made a movie of it on Netflix. Oh, altogether. yes. Maybe that's the one I'm thinking of. Well, The Remarkable Journey of Coyote Sunrise has a picture of a girl, blonde girl wearing sunglasses, sitting on the top of a school bus with a cat. So you weren't wrong yeah. that book exists. Oh, um, man. I'm a very visual like person. <laughs> one of my all-time favorite books, and it made me cry out of every emotion which mm -hmm. has never happened before um so yeah, big sort of like a rock star was that was yeah that was a big one for like kids coming in and asking like they had the title they had the author they wanted like it wasn't like a recommended read it was like although I I, I love the kids who come in and they're like um I want sad books <laughs> and I'm like oh <laughs> like and like, I have, I have like the ones I, I, you know, like uh, the thing about jellyfish or forever or a long, long time. And like, you know, like the girl in the well is me, like all of those, I can just sort of rattle off and stuff. But like, it's always, it's always interesting when somebody comes in and they're like, I want to read something that's going to make me suffer. <laughs> like I want, I want to expand. I want to be sad. <laughs> you know, I want to learn like. I know uh, Matthew Quick does not need my endorsement. He is a very popular man. Um, but I will say something I love about him is all of his books have happy endings. They don't always make up for the rest of the book. Um, there's a couple of things that fell a little flat for me, but um, knowing that when I pick up that book, it's going to torture me, but it's going to have a happy ending does so much for me. Um, yeah, yeah, I think, well, because for a long time, I didn't read stuff that wasn't a, a genre like fantasy science fiction horror like something I didn't read something set like real kids in real places with real problems because you know like I don't want to be sitting at the reference desk reading something like sobbing <laughs> but then you know the the first time I got asked that like I want something that's like a drama or like tragic you know like like those buzzwords came through I was kind of like yeah I do need to expand you know and it's it's definitely not my favorite genre but like the ones I've read were like really stuck with me you know like more than like the eight million you know running from a monster in the forest books I've read well, what's really special about fantasy, especially I think with um, children's lit, which I mean, mm. I know that adult books too, and I have a whole, whole rant about um, <laughs> marketing. Uh, <laughs> but um, I think what's really special about um, fantasy, especially for, for children or um, children's lit, is that it's, it's still the same issues. We're just adding something fanciful. So it, it's, it feels mm. more like escapism. Um, mm -hmm. that's actually something I think about a lot because I loved fantasy as a kid and I cannot read adult fantasy. I can't do yeah. it. Yeah, um, same. I think my suspension of disbelief is broken or something. Um, <laughs> I uh, just, it, I don't know. There's something it's okay. So I read, uh, there was a kid's book I read called small spaces, which is phenomenal. And it's also like, super super easy to pitch to like a class like I always use it for a book talk because it's like the setting is just perfect it's like okay this girl and her class are going on a field trip to a farm in the fall and the bus breaks down and a fog rolls in and the teacher says I have to go back to the farm to call because my cell phone doesn't have reception and he leaves and the bus driver turns to our main character and says they're coming you should run if you don't want to be taken and she like grabs her two friends and they like run off the bus just in time to see a bunch of scarecrows kidnap their entire class dun 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 <laughs> what was that book called? This whole it's called small spaces so the whole like the whole book is like the the big plot of it is um this girl 
and her two friends, like they see their classmates get kidnapped and the smiling man is after them and they have to like, they're in this sort of like limbo world where they run into like ghosts from this like old folk tale that they heard at the farm in the beginning of the book. And like, um, you know, they have to like pass these trials and stuff like that. Um, but the, the heart of the story is this girl is dealing with her mother's death and she's having like a lot of like struggle with that. And she's having a hard time connecting to other kids her age because she's suffered in a way that they don't really like understand. Um, and her mother's ghost starts speaking to her and giving her warnings so that they're able to like escape capture from these scarecrow monsters and stuff. Um, and so it's sort of like, you know, she's still sad that her mom is gone, but she like gains these two friendships and like, you know, she, she overcomes all these struggles and stuff. And she still feels like, you know, her mother isn't gone, gone, you know, and like her memory is still there. And, you know, she can talk about the good times and like, you know, it's, it's, and it's short, it's like, yay, yay thick or so. And it's, so it's not like trying to give a kid like a book this big, you know, and it's, it's got, the sequel's really good too. Um, but the first one was just like, so, so good, you know? And that's like, that's one of those, like, the story couldn't be told without the horror elements and like the supernatural element with the ghosts and everything. Um, but you still have that, like, that line, that tether to the real world that I really liked. Cause there's like, there's some sci-fi and like, horror that you read where it's like you don't need the horror and that yeah. that I just tend to I never recommend those like if the if the science fiction stuff doesn't matter to the story then it's not science fiction to me like I just can't <laughs> you know totally but uh, I had a thought and it went oh I didn't have a relevant thought it was just about Eva Ibbotson existing. yeah no <laughs> <laughs> that was that was she was one of my favorites as a kid and you know um something you see a lot too in children's fantasy is you know there's a there's a sad kid and I think that um at least for a while what we got out of um children's lit was an escapism for sad kids like we assumed that kids who spend their time reading are sad um which is kind of awful um and we don't have that so much anymore right with um with characters like um whatever the girl's name is from sort of like a rock star um and percy percy jackson mm. um, you know they're they're fun kids who like maybe something sad has happened to them but they're still a lot of fun their, they their, their lives are more complex than the one thing that they could yeah I mean it, yeah I mean I guess that's that's with children's lit people try to like dumb things down for kids where it's like this is okay so I read one this was like okay so it's called um if this was a story or if this were a story or something like that um and it's like it, it's like how not to write a child like the whole book <laughs> was just a great example of like none of these kids exist <laughs> like I know because it's and it's because our main character girl is like she's so quiet and introspective and she she thinks like five steps ahead and like you know she's in like fourth grade or something like that and it's like and, and oh my gosh it they kept saying like oh she's so mature for her age I'm like that just means that you wrote a bad kid like yeah you know that's, that's it, a pet of mine and this is going to be a hot take. yeah it's something that drives me nuts about john green his, his teenagers are very college student-esque he is a good writer don't get me wrong um oh but sure they're all very like yeah college, college student-esque they're very like art school uh intellectuals <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of YA where it's like, this would be a better book if this, if they were 19 and 20, and this was set in a college dorm, not yeah. a high school, but, but you need the high school framework for the plot. Y your characters are just like a, a, adults who are 25 
who Hollywood has decided can play teenagers. You know what I mean? Beautiful description. <laughs> and I get it. Like, that's a lot of media that we, like, consume. And so it's easy to look at, like, okay, well, I don't know any teenagers, but I've seen 8 million movies featuring teenagers in a high school. You know, I watched Clueless. Like, you know. <laughs> and it's, like, I don't know. I There's a lot of, like, YA um, thrillers that are out now that are like, you know, oh, this app is trying to kill people or, you know, oh, like, you know, stuff like that where it's like the way that all of these teenagers respond to stuff. It's like, oh, they're freshmen in high school, but they act like they're freshmen in college, you know? And I'm like- One of my favorite topics to be angry about. (laughs) Um, I did this, I I had this discovery at some point in in college. I know exactly what point, but it's not relevant. Uh, It was in a children's lit class, of course, uh, that YA and a lot of children's lit is only children's lit for marketing reasons. Um, Mm. It's entirely based on, you know, the age of the the protagonist, right? We would never put To Kill a Mockingbird in the children's section, um, Mm -hmm. even though Scout is nine or whatever. and um what is it i saw perks of being a wallflower when that first came out it was in regular lit it's not anymore it's in um this is a very strange memory someone recommended it to me and i went to borders um so it's clearly an aged memory they did Uh, (laughs) and i looked in the ya section for it and it wasn't there so that's how i know um that's also how i know the author's last name started with a c is because I know what shelf I found it on at Borders. <laughs> um, also visual, I see. <laughs> um, and that's the that, that drives me nuts. You know, if we gave mm-hmm. writers the freedom to write stories without saying how we're going to market it, I think that we would yeah. have higher quality work in in protagonists who are younger. And also mm. we, would, we would allow, I don't know, there's like a certain level of shame, I think, when you're at the wrong age or just the right age of going into the children's section, you know? Um, I remember when I was like 10, I was ashamed that I was still playing with Barbies. So I would like put on a face when I would go to the Barbie aisle. Um, And I feel like- I'm just, I'm just, I'm just perusing, you know, and seeing what the little kids are doing. Um, You know, I I assume I was probably the same way about going to the children's section to find YA books, which again at, at Borders, it was like a wall on the outside of Children's, which is clever. Um, And at a lot of libraries, I know there's a separate section for children, or for YA, but how are you? That's a, so, you know? mm -hmm. That's actually an interesting, so in libraries, every library does things sort of differently. Tinley had this uh, like very rigid um, like separation So there was like the picture books, then there were the, like the beginner readers, like the Mo Willems books, like, you know, Elephant and Piggy, like little words and stuff like that, small sentences. Then there was like, yeah, he's great. Um, And there was like the, the chapter books where it's like less than 50 pages, illustrations, um, but they're not the readers. And then there was the, the middle grade fiction, the J fiction. And like no protagonist could be over 13. And like, so it was really more of like the like second grade to like fourth grade, maybe fifth grade books. And then YA was everything that had a 13 year old protagonist and up. That wasn't adult. And so the like, yeah, so it's like the J section was where all the parents came in to look for books for their like, you know, elementary and middle school age kids. But the teen section was where everything was, but the te- they, they didn't want to take their their middle schooler to the teen section because the teen books also had the sex drugs and rock and roll and they they didn't want them to peruse and so it was just like this weird and Winneka has it has a different um category section where they have like the picture books like the leveled readers um and then the middle grade fiction is everything from first grade to fifth grade and then they have junior high which is stuff that you would see either in a middle grade section or the teen section 
but the teen section is like exclusively for the sex, drugs, and rock and roll books. So our junior high and our teen is the same reading level. It's just content based. At least that's what I like from what I've been able to like see. I, I that's what I think it is. Like I haven't talked to the woman who actually purchases the books and been like, what's because like you know you can kind of tell like you know like the court of thorns and roses books are in the teen hallway that are outside of the kids section but percy jackson is in junior high i actually Thanks. really really love this idea there's so many kids um you know i i worked with kids for a long time specifically in in shelters and or in um like community centers with kids who weren't showing up and there's mm. so many there are so many kids who will not read children's books because it's not, uh, they won't read books that are at their quote reading level um, mm -hmm. because it looks dumb or the content is not their their maturity level, right? So yeah. you've got a year old kid who's maybe reading, um, I don't know, easier to read books, but the content isn't right for him because mm -hmm you know he's he's developed in all the other ways his reading's just behind and then if you the way the way you would separate it by content just makes my heart sing um because then you know you've got the book that's right for for this kid who doesn't want to be embarrassed by reading something for for kids or yeah isn't it? It, because it's not what he's living yeah yeah and i i really like we have like um so the way that the space is sort of separated out at Winneka, I also really like for this specific reason. Because um, when you come in the glass doors of the children's section, it's like a turn off from the entrance and there's a very clear separation. Like that's the rest of the library, this is where the kids come. Um, you go through the glass doors and off to your left is like a little divot that has tables and a big um, chalk wall like where you can draw on it and everything. And all of the junior high fiction books are there. And then you can kind of go past and like go go past this like separation wall that we have in there. And the rest of the kids section is like the little kids stuff. You know, we have like the Lego table and like the coloring pages and stuff like that, like over there. So if you come in with your little siblings and they're gonna run and look at picture books and stuff like, oh, I'm cool. I'm gonna go hang out in the junior high section. But your mom's not gonna totally lose her mind because you're not gonna see like, you know, the stuff that's for adults who read YA because that's in the teen hallway, you know? And so it's, because a lot of YA stuff that's being published as YA literature now is like adult material, you know? Because there's this big group of like, you know, early twenties people who read YA and so they started publishing YA for those people, but now freshmen in high school are like, uh, this is like a 20 page sex scene. <laughs> like, and don't get me wrong. Like I love the Court of Thorns and Roses series. It's just, it, I would pitch it to an adult than more than I would pitch it to an actual teenager, even though it's shelved in YA for that reason. You know, it's- marketing. Yeah, it's tough because it's like the first one is really good and like there isn't a ton of sex in it and it's it's a really good exploration of um so it's it's a retelling of Beauty and the Beast with like fairy courts and all this stuff and it's it's fantastic. Like I I love this series. Um and the second book is like even better than the first one and the first one was on the Lincoln list for a year I don't remember which year it is let's say like 2015 16 or so um but the second book so like this girl goes through these trials to free the fairy court from this like evil sorceress right and she like is tortured and like terrible things happen to her like it's like it's really traumatic stuff um and a lot of times it's like ah we beat the bad guy everything's great now like you did it and the second book is her dealing with the post-traumatic stress of having to do all of this horrible, horrible stuff. Like she used to kill somebody and she's like, you know, traumatized by this. And so the second book is like really diving into that and how like everyone around her is telling her, well, you won, you should be happy now. And she's like, oh my God, I'm having horrible nightmares. Like I see myself like fighting this worm monster and like, 
and then and it's so so good but the there's there's literally a 20 page like sex scene at the end of this that is like so explicit I mean and it's like multiple sessions like you know all these like positions and like and I'm like reading this and I'm like man this is a really great book and like everything but like oh my god I could just imagine the parent coming in and being like um what, what is my freshman reading and I'm like oh my god so it's honestly I might skip it if it's 20 pages like <laughs> I mean for an adult for like I've had a college student come in and they're like I, I like reading YA I just you know I don't really want to go to adult fit fantasy because it's Game of Thrones is really a lot yes. and like you know like that's there's a lot of rape in that you know you don't really get that in YA fantasy but she likes the saucy stuff so like for this 21 year old I was like perfect this is written specifically for you <laughs> but like I don't know it's it's tough because it's like you don't and kids will self-censor if they're reading something that they're uncomfortable with they'll just put it down like I started awesome. reading Stardust hey. is like I think I was in middle school and it Stardust starts off with a sex scene and I was like but that was just me as a kid. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. That's, it's... that's something that I think, uh, oh, this is a great segue. Um, people who are pro censorship don't ever mm. realize like kids will self censor and yeah. And they know when something's not right for them and, or they know when they're not understanding what they're reading. Um, yeah. So, uh, with that as a segue, Band Books Week is coming up. Is that next Yay! week? Yay! Um, what, I mean, what can you recommend to us? Oh, no, oh my God, ahead. I have so many. I have so many feelings about Band Books Week. I love Band Books Week. Um, it, week after next is Band Books Week. It's, it's always interesting to me because it's like, okay, so I, maybe I wouldn't pitch A Court of Thorns and Roses to a, to a freshman class at a high school or something like that. But I definitely think we should own it. And I definitely think that people who want to read that kind of thing should have it. You know, a lot of women writers get sort of funneled into YA instead of adult literature, which is, I think, a marketing issue. And, and I'm really excited because Sarah J. Moss, the one who wrote The Court of Thorns and Roses, her new series, um, the, the Crimson Moon or something, she, I read it. It was fantastic but it's actually marketed as an adult book and it's like yes she writes for adults she writes for me I'm 30 and I love her stuff like just let it be for adults but uh -huh. yeah no I that's my soapbox about the whole YA thing you know and it's I don't know band books week is great because it's like it's always fun to, to pitch something to a kid who's like Oh, you're not supposed to have this, but here you go, you know? And it's the reasonings behind stuff getting challenged fascinate me, you know? Like Twilight, Twilight was a huge, like, oh, we need to get this out of libraries and I don't want my kid having access to this. And like, and the reasons were like all over the place, you know, it's conservatives and liberals being like, no, down with Twilight. Like, oh, Bella's not feminist enough. And oh, there's like, it's this relationship with a monster, like it, all kinds of stuff. It was bonkers. And I'm just like, my kids That's read so it. Bad. Twilight wasn't as bad as you think it was. Like, <laughs> the word cloud from ALA for 2019's band, band books. Um, and the biggest one is LGBT. LGBT? Plus. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say. Political viewpoint and sexually explicit. Those are the three big, like the largest ones because it's a word cloud. And then we've mm -hmm. got fake news, graphic illustrations, anti-police, uh, sex ed, bias, profanity, witchcraft, gender dysphoria, religious- Oh, witchcraft. Uh, violence. I already said a lot of them. I didn't read them in order. Inaccurate, racist content, nudity. I feel like I'm very disappointed by the size of racist content versus uh, <laughs> right though. It's not. It's the third or fourth largest size. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. The stuff that gets challenged. I, it's, it's, very, it's so interesting to me because it's like, you know, coming from the library world, like going through school, getting your master's degree is very much like, you know, give everybody everything. If they don't want it, they don't have to have it, you know, which is a beautiful standpoint. And then you get into a class where, you know, somebody's like, wait, Rush Limbaugh wrote a children's book that's incredibly racist or like puts himself as like, I don't even remember. I didn't read it. I just remember it came out and everybody was like, well, I'm not buying that for my collection. And it's like, well, some conservative might want it for their kid. Like, why not? You know, they, it, yeah, it has to go both ways. Too. To go both ways. Uh, yeah, pretty much. It's like, yeah, I don't want to read it, <laughs> you know, but somebody might, you know, and I, once we start we, to once we start to try any kind of censorship, it's it's all downhill from there. Yeah, yeah, and it's like there are there are plenty of good reasons that you don't want this book for you or your kids. I I fully understand that. I had a mom bring me a picture book, and she was like, "Okay, I'm not one of those people," and I'm like oh my god, which one of these people is she, in the, is she gonna be in a second here, you know, like, it's like, a, I'm not racist, but statement, like, right, and she was like, I was reading this picture book from your trains section to my kid, and I'm like, uh-huh, and she's like, and it has this little kid jumping in front of a train, because she wants to hug the train and make it stop, and I feel like that's dangerous, and I'm like, you got a point, <laughs> Like, are we going to pull this book from the collection? Uh, probably not. Maybe. But like, yeah, okay. You know, and it's like, I could just yeah. see her, like the wheels turning. It's like, oh man, the only people who try to get books banned are those, you know, crazies who hate something. And like, but she was like, I just don't like this kid jumping in front of the train. I'm trying to teach my son to be safe around trains. Right. And I'm like... <laughs> I gotta give you this one. like that's at least where the discussion you know I but I don't you know, know I mean the, the band books that everybody talks about are like the, the big like they're all like like, like, <laughs> like prince and knight yes. you know like this is a picture book about the prince and he marries the knight and it's beautiful and I love this book but like I what, what was the reason cited for this one probably I think ALA had it but it was something like promotes the homosexual agenda or like oh like God. normalizes <laughs> you know and I'm just like but it's so it's so sweet and it's like and it's the conflict is like he needs to get married he meets his all these princes and he just isn't really like feeling it and his parents are really sad and then the dragon attacks because it's a dragon and he like runs to go fight this dragon and he's fighting this dragon and a knight shows up and he he falls he falls from the dragon and then he he the knight catches him like it's so sweet <laughs> right <laughs> and like they're just and like, I love oh, how nobody man. Is, nobody's uh, necessarily like I don't want to say this because it's a gendered word, but like there's no damsel in distress, right? He's fighting on his own and then someone comes and helps. He's not just being saved. And they did it together. And like, I'm, I'm going to read this for my, my little video that for like reading five minutes of a band book for your, for your project and everything. So like, you'll see this one. It's so good. Um, but like his parents are like, oh good. You found someone that makes you happy. That's so wonderful. And then they get married. And the whole, and like everybody, look at all these people, they're all so happy. And they're just like, and this, this one was like, I think this was number three on the list for last year or something. It was like, no. And I'm like, no, it's so good. Uh, I don't know. I have, I have more here because you were talking about man books. So I got my favorites. Uh, yeah, show us. The Wizard of Oz. This was banned by the. It. This was banned by the Chicago Public Library in I think it was 1928 because it shows a woman in a leadership position. Oh, nice. 
I was like, no, dude. And Frank was banned because it's depressing. <laughs> oh, and well, I'm let's like, not learn about the Holocaust. It is sad. I'll give you that. Like, um, so this was this was my my controversial uh, pick mm. for favorite band book. And this is the, the bad cover because let's just pretend like the show doesn't yes. exist. Well, the show does that book came out in like 2000. It did it's it's pretty old. That's true. The the show does oh, sorry, a lot of things. Saying, I remember the other cover. Yeah, it's it's like a girl on a swing. Um mm-hmm. because it's more focused on her. It is her story, you know. So her being on the cover, I think, really helps. Um But I mean, in an adaptation, they have to change a lot of stuff. But I think they made choices that they didn't have to make for an adaptation that really damaged the point of the story. And because I mean, having to make it longer for the show for 13 episodes, he couldn't do it in one night. Okay, sure. You know, they have to flush out the other characters because he interacts with them as he's like listening to the tapes. Okay, sure. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to get more character stuff. But like the gratuitous showing of her bleeding out on the basketball court, that's when I stopped watching the show because I was like, this is not. I had stopped watching the show too. Yeah. But like this book is so good. And I, I have, I have like a weird like thing with this one too because I actually read the copy that had his original written ending in it as like a oh this is popular again we're gonna reprint it and here's like a fun thing that might not that you might not have seen before so buy the book again but the author Jay Asher wrote a different ending for his book and the publishers came in and said no this is how we want it to end so rewrite it rewrite the ending and it makes me mad for two reasons. One, because I picked up on all the signals and I figured out the twist at the end and then it didn't happen. So I knew something was wrong <laughs> because if you read enough books, you you get really like zeroed in on those little things and stuff. And so like pretty much nothing surprises me. And if it does surprise me, it's, it's because you foreshadowed wrong. Like you basically just didn't at this point. But in the original written ending, she survives her suicide attempt and she's in the hospital. Um, And so at the end, he goes to school the next day after listening to all the tapes and he's like in his own like headspace about it. And um, the girl who in the original written ending, he like sees a girl in the hallway and she also looks depressed and he like goes after her to go talk to her to try to like, you know, I'm not going to make this mistake again. I'm not going to let someone walk away from me again, right? And like, that's the original ending, which is also a a good point. But that girl comes up to him and is like, did you hear she woke up? And he like, the book ends with him like running out of the school to go and see her. And like, I just feel that so much more powerful and such a better message for teens because- Yes. It kind of feels like a revenge fantasy story, but if she if she doesn't actually, know, I know that. yeah, yeah, and so his original yeah, no, this... written ending, she survives her suicide attempt, and the the main character of the story I'm goes to, to imagine in the hospital, being and that's like... how it ends. I can't imagine the publisher shitting on that. Pardon my Their basic premise was like, well, it's more it's it's more powerful as a revenge story because if she survives, this isn't a revenge story because action can be taken. You know, like she's confessed all this stuff on these tapes. People, more people know what happened to her and everything. And like, if she's alive, there's something to be done about it basically, you know? And like, she could testify. She could, you know, like there's, there's wrongs that can be righted. But with her dying, it's like, gotcha. (laughs) And I just, because he wrote it, I think he had, I want to say an aunt. um, Because he writes like a preface to like what the original ending was was for him. He had an aunt who actually did try to commit suicide and her success, or she was not successful. Um, And he 
was really like hurt and scared by this. And like, he kind of wrote the book as a way to process this. Like who, who would go down this road? Who would make this decision to try to take their life, you know? And in his original ending, it was trying to stay true to this thing that happened to him, you know? Where he wasn't directly responsible, but he felt like he had some stake in why these things happened. And so he wanted to give his main character the chance to sort of go after this and like try to fix something and you know like that kind of thing um and the publisher basically was like no we we don't like that as much it's not it's not as like whoa or like you know sensational I guess I don't know but the book is so much better than the show <laughs> and like people started <laughs> trying to get this book banned after the show came out and I was really upset because the, huh. the show does a lot of things wrong that is not the fault of the book. You know what I mean? That's that's interesting and, and upsetting. Yeah, because I think when it first came out, I don't remember when it first came out if it was uh, challenged or not, but when it made all the lists was after the Netflix show came out. So if you look like a couple years ago, it's it's on the list you know the top 10 challenged books in america from ala like it's all there and it's it's because the show didn't handle the subject matter as well as the book did and i you know i mean the, who knows if there's a perfect way to handle the subject matter but talking about it at all is important you know and it's like it's like speak always gets challenged you know or banned and it's like it's like oh this is really depressing and like oh this is really sad and scary and it's like this happens to kids like this happens to teenagers they need to not talking about it it's made worse by not talking about it yeah and a lot of times too the kids who are looking for that kind of stuff are the ones who aren't dealing with it themselves they're they know someone who is and they can't ask that person questions i feel like that's a lot of um so many kids have been coming in asking for the hate you give um and like a good mm -hmm. kind of trouble and all those books um because they don't know they don't know that struggle and they don't they don't have anybody that right. they books feel comfortable asking them. yeah and it's sort of like it's a way for them to you know because you can google it and you can talk to people online but you don't know if the person you're talking to is actually a person of color like you know like Everybody always talks about like, you know, oh, Twitter says, and I'm like, does Twitter say this? Do we know any of these people or who they say they are? I don't know. I just feel like with books, you know, the author's name is on there. Like we know who this is. Like we know if they're a credible source or not. So I can, I can pitch this book being like, this is someone who knows, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, easier to vet than the internet. Yeah. Well, and a lot of times there's been a lot more thought put through it and there's um, multiple people have read it and looked at it and like discussed it and like, you know, there's there's more to it than just like some Tumblr posts, you know, like it's nice to see all right. these kids wanting to know about this kind of stuff, you know, and it's like, it's tough and it's, it's stressful, you know, and it's like, things to be sad about you didn't know you needed to be sad about before and like that's a lot for a kid to like invite in but the kids who do are just you know they're so much more insightful and like you know they're they're the kids who really like go go far they do a lot you know and it's not just like I'm going to be in my happy bubble it's like I want to know as much as I can you know and that's that's so great <laughs> I'm just glad that more of those books are being published now too. Right. It's yeah. also something that's at least, I'm sure this will change a little bit, but um, up until this point, all of those books that I've encountered have been really, really quality. And I'm sure that, you know, there's gonna be an uptick in like low quality um, books on tough subjects because it's, the subjects get hot. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, all of the books that I've that I've encountered on on these tough topics have been really, really good. Like Speak, mm -hmm. like um, On the Come Up, 
like um, symptoms of being human, like the birds, the bees, and you and me. Um, these are all just really high quality books that talk about, I hate saying this, but controversial topics. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that's all I really have to say. They're just the books that you can find on these topics that are going to teach you, especially they're either going to make you feel not alone because you're living this, or they're going to teach you because you're an outsider and they've got, you know, really compelling characters. They've got really well written plot. They're, mm -hmm. they're written by these people who know and understand and are informed. Yeah. So you're not, you're not well, even walking into a, a, a field where you're going to be, you know, taken by the, taken by the hand or, or led around by someone who doesn't know what they're saying yeah. and or is bad at writing. <laughs> well, and I, I think some of my favorite things about publishing nowadays too, is that like, there's a lot of authors who are from a marginalized group who are getting their books published when they otherwise wouldn't have. And that's like, I, and it's like, they write about stuff that, you know, the kids love and the kids are really into and are really passionate about. And then they like drop in like, um, like I read this book, it was called Peeves. And Peeves is also, is fantastic. It, it's 10 out of 10 in my book. I love this one. Um, but it's like with everything that's going, so it's um, a science experiment goes wrong and this kid gets splashed with something at his dad's office and his pet Peeves comes to life as like a fuzzy monster that bothers him. So like he wakes up and his alarm starts going off and he's like, oh, I hate the sound of that alarm. And then like a, a boop, and then there's a monster and it goes, meh, 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 and then it follows him around all day doing that. And then if he seizes on someone, they catch this and then they have their own peeves and like this whole town gets overrun by peeves. It's great. It's, this sounds like it's not so, but it's so good. But it's great because this author uses this bizarre situation to explore this kid having extreme social anxiety and like, you know, his parents have like, I think it's his, I think it's his mom has like a deadline anxiety. So she gets this peeve that's like, well, you know, this is coming up. Well, you know, you have this on your list. Well, you didn't do this at five o'clock this morning. So now your entire day is thrown off. And like, you see the manifestation of these anxieties and these fears and you're just, you know, um, his little sister has a peeve that says, your parents love him more than you. Look at how much attention they're paying to him. You only have one peeve. He's got six. And it's like, oh my God. Like, this is the manifestation of that. Like, I'm a, I'm a sibling to a sibling that has a lot of issues and my parents don't pay as much attention to me. And that hurts me. And here is this monster saying this out loud. And the parents are like, oh my God, we're so sorry. Like, we didn't know you felt this way. And like, and it's so good. And there's like a, a side character who has two dads. And like, the two dads are like the functioning couple. And it's so beautiful. And it's just like, the author who wrote this, because I had to look up who this guy was after I read this book, because I was just like, oh my God, I don't, I haven't read something in so long that was this, this engaging. And he's gay. And I was like, this is great, because he just put in these characters that, you know, he, they're probably people he knows, or like, it's, it was just really beautiful to see this, like, representation in this situation that had nothing to do with any of that stuff. They were just people in the world, you know? And it was so... You should read Peeves. I have a lot of feelings about Peeves. I'm definitely going to. Oh yeah. It has a fantastic like, cover. List. Oh yeah. Like I know you're not supposed to judge a book by a cover, but like I do. <laughs> do, do you have it nearby? I don't. I don't own it actually. <laughs> I I don't I, I don't buy a ton of books have to look it up. anymore. You I'd like to. <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, yeah do you, did you have any anything else in your pile you wanted to show us? You said you brought no, some books no. In. Those were the those are the three that I have here. Um, sorry, Wait, what was I the am third? like surrounded by. Oh, this was the the 
13 Reasons, the oh, this one, and I then the picture book. This is so innocuous. I know, right? right? Like I've read, I've read it, I've read it, and it's. I don't even know if I could. I assume it's Dorothy. I, I don't it know was, if I could call it a leader. <laughs> well, I think it was also. I think um, witchcraft was also cited because there's I'm sure. the good witch and the bad witch. Which literally which is a fascinating, like reason to cite for that stuff because just you can throw that at like one and a half of things on the show. <laughs> right. Also, like oh my god, I mean that's a whole different conversation. Um, do you have any? I'll um probably let you go on with your life soon. Um, <laughs> but do you have any um advice for navigating libraries during COVID? navigating the library system, libraries online, library services. Wear a mask. <laughs> I cannot, I cannot beg people enough for this. Please just do it. I, and, and it's like, Winnetka is a really interesting situation because, um, so there's this concept of libraries being a third space. Um, it's a place, it's not your home, it's not your work. But it's somewhere you can be where you don't have to spend money to be allowed there. Um, parks, you know, there's um, there's a lot of places that are like the third space, but a library is one of those places. And before COVID, we had uh, nannies and kids hang out like for hours and hours. They would, you know, play with the Lego table. They would color pages. We would have a little scavenger hunt for them to do. We had iPads that we could check out for like 30 minutes where like we had all these kid focused games and we had all these like little, it's like a, you read a book, but you interact with it. Like there's a monster at the end mm -hmm. of the story app, um, which is great. Like the physical copy of that one is, is cute, but actually having to pull all of the paper clips off the page and watching, I think what is it, Grover get like more like upset at you doing it and then you turn the page and he's like no why would you turn the page there's a monster at the end of this book um but yeah we had all this like stuff to do um and we don't have any of that now so we we get sometimes people coming in and they're like where's all the all the toys like we wanted to not be in our house for a while and we're wearing our masks and i'm like we can't clean things enough <laughs> for us to have out it's hard enough to legos <laughs> you know and like the books that we have we quarantine for seven days so it's like you return something and it goes into a room and it sits in the dark by itself you know with all the other that day books and like eventually we pull it out and put it back on the shelf but like you know holds are taking longer and we want we want to give people the books we want people to have them but it's like we get them shipped from other places. We don't know what their quarantine rules are. So we just use ours and like, we just have to wait. And like, we want we want people to come in and pick out books. And like people have been calling for um, like recommended books on all of our apps. You know, like we have the Hoopla books, we have Overdrive and Libby books. And we've been buying a ton of things like eBooks and e-audio books and stuff. Um, to try to make sure that we have stuff for people to use, which is great. Um, you know, it's just that we can't, it, we can't be that third space right now. And it's so hard because it's like, kids are doing their school online. And if they have younger siblings that are loud, they just want to sit somewhere. And, and we have to be like, you can't hang out. Like you, you need to like pick whatever you're here to get and then like go home. And like, it's really tough and it's, I, I hate doing it because it's like, you just want people to find a place where they can like do their work or just hang out or, you know, read together. You know, like I had a mom come in with her kids and they just sat on the floor and read a couple picture books and went home because we didn't have our couch, like our big windy couch, they couldn't sit anywhere. And I was just like, I'm sorry. <laughs> and it's, it's tough. But it's like, we also kind of have to be the like police people in that sense where it's like, this is for your best interest. And like, I know that you're tired of being, being at home. Like I was tired of being at home and now I'm only at home and here, <laughs> and, you know? And it's, it's tough 
but like we we still want people to come in and get their stuff we just can't hang out and I hope that I mean we're still doing programs which is nice like I do the zoom story times and uh like I teach art classes which is <laughs> sorry sorry he's going for a nap um oh, I he's absolutely welcome uh I would love to look at him <laughs> Um, you actually, you mentioned the yeah. art. I know as someone who's been a nanny that libraries are, I mean, as someone who mm -hmm. reads books, libraries are my favorite place. Um, but as a nanny, I know that that's like a really, really, really special resource. Um, yeah. You mentioned having, having families show up on your digital story time now. Is that, um, is that new? Is that different? Are you still seeing a bunch of nannies? Uh, it's some, yeah, some. Um, I had... It was, it was great. I had um, a new person um, with two little ones, like a, like a baby baby. And then a little boy who was like probably getting close to three. And uh, she was, she clearly was like, I'm, I'm a new nanny. Like I did my homework and she signed them up for story time and everything. And she was like, okay, so this is 30 minutes. We're going to do this. And then we're going to move on to the next activity and like all this stuff. And I was like, Max, we got this. It's all good. Like we're gonna have a great time, you know. And like, there's a bunch of um, stay-at-home parents who struggled to, you know, get in the car and get there on time and like all that kind of stuff. And like, um, so I do the literacy laps at Bright Beginnings, is what it's called, and it's um, zero to eighteen months, and that's a hard age group because. The, the, the first year they're not really paying attention and it's the story time isn't really for them it's for you know the parent or caregiver um to teach them how to interact with the kid so it's a lot more of like okay we're going to read this sentence and then tell me what colors you see let's count on the page you know and so like it's more of like like showing them how to do it whereas like an all ages story time is like okay, you're five-year-olds, we're gonna do the hokey pokey. <laughs> like, we're gonna shake our wiggles out and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so it's been fun because the, the parents who come to the Zoom story time want to learn that stuff. And it's like, before I had like all these nannies who would come in who were like, this is our 30 minutes at the library for story time, go sit, I'm gonna be on my phone. And so it's like, I'd have parents who were trying to engage, but then these kids were running around because they were like the walking age, but they weren't like, you really need um, an adult to engage with you for the kid to want to engage with you. And so with the Zoom story times, like that's all I've been getting, which has been so, so great. And it's like, these parents were really passionate about like, you know, okay, we're gonna learn our colors. We're gonna count, we're gonna clap, we're gonna do all this stuff. And like watching the kids figure out how to do like itsy bitsy spider, you know, with their hands, watching like mom, like, watching the computer, and, like, you know? And it's been really, yeah, it's been really, really beautiful. And like, I just love the like, more individual attention that I can give the Zoom story times. Like, even if I have a whole bunch of boxes, like I can see everyone the same, you know, it's not a crowd. And so I actually like this better <laughs> than the in-person ones, but like, yeah, I don't know. It's been probably a lot less clean up too. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. My, I always felt <laughs> at the end when I would go to story time, you know, as a caregiver, I would always be like, man, I do not want to clean these toys. You know, the we have, um, yeah, it, it's like, um, I'm allergic to perfumes. So we had to get these like unscented sanitizing wipes and it's just like every single bouncy ball, you know, every single block. And like you, you block out, you know, an hour and a half, two hours for story time. Cause you know, good 30 minutes is set up, 30 minutes is doing. And then like 30 minutes to an hour is cleaning. <laughs> I bet, I, I bet. Um, well, um, is there anything else you want to add? I, I feel like I could listen to you talk forever and, um, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's awesome for me. Um, but I know I'm a talker too, so <laughs> I don't want to, 
I don't want to take the whole day for anybody. So what? Um, sure, sure. What, what um, do you want to leave us? In? Read Ben books. <laughs> yeah. Always read Ben books. We're gonna have Maddie here back. Yes, we're gonna have you back for the Ben books reading. Is that right? Yeah. I'm you, you, you have to say yes now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, so ordinarily we end with um, with a free write. Do you want to give us a prompt? We won't do we won't do five minutes of silence. But do you have any any prompt you want to leave our audience with? Write your favorite childhood memory. I love that. I love that. And also <laughs> something you said that I think could work well with this um, as an alternative. Um, what did you need to read as a kid? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I needed so happy endings. That's for yeah. sure. I was not into yeah. them, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, something I, I like to add for, for the free write so that it's no pressure. It's okay if it turns into a journal, especially given write your favorite childhood memory that can lead a lot of places. Um, and uh, yeah. Give yourself some time and some space to do that free write. Um, thank you so, 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 so much, Maddie, for coming on. This was probably the highlight of my week. Um, <laughs> and, uh, to everyone, to everyone, I hope you can uh, write more light into your life.